Bonsoir. Uh, good afternoon. Hi, Jane. <laughs> Hi, <How are> Jan. <laughs> good to see you again. Likewise. Uh, this um, conversation we we kind of thought would be nice to to start from what's here, what's around, uh, from the exhibition we worked on together, and from there to kind of navigate and travel back and forth um, in space and time and also through your your work and research from here back to uh, another place that is very dear to to you and um, the most uh, practical would be to start for me from uh, what we are we have really like in front of us is uh, these um, boxes these red boxes that uh, you you saw already uh, and uh, the more I see them uh, the more I kind of um, feel like they they are not really a collection or recollection um, they don't uh, compose a totality uh, in these boxes you accumulated uh, a multitude of findings, fragments, uh, objects that you researched, that you found, sometimes by chance, sometimes uh, by chasing them. Um, but what's very interesting is that they are like um, collected f for sure, but they are also kind of uh, accumulated in these boxes. They are placed on top of each other as a sort of fragile or precarious organization um, and they, they compose a sort of fragmentary sort of narrative. For, that's why for me they are not really like a collection or they don't really uh, build uh, a proper, extremely clear or articulated sort of narrative but they, they kind of open different possibilities in um, political but also very poetical uh, way, I guess. Sometimes there are indexes of something, sometimes there are proofs of other things. And um, in the end, uh, I've been thinking that they compose a sort of series of small landscapes that are haunted or that are like, they have a sort of life within them that your discourse and the the stories that you tell about them and the way you invite the viewer to navigate through them kind of animated, uh, animate these sort of historical landscapes. <laughs> Thank you, Jan, and nice to be in conversation with you. Uh, no, it's very interesting, like the way you, you go to the composition also of the boxes. Um, and as you said, they're composed of very different types of, of objects that I began to collect um, around 2015 and onwards, you know, for some years. So some of the, and, and, and I think, I mean, as you said, like th there's something about the way in which they're composed where they don't constitute a totality as such. I mean, they're, they're composed of fragments and also of fractured histories. Um, there are objects and materials that I found in North Korea and in South Korea and in Denmark and in the United States. And, you know, some of them I was drawn to because of um, the particular, all of them are sort of related to the particular thematics of the work. Um, but it's in an associative way also, some of them, you know, so some of them you don't immediately perhaps connect to these two histories of um, women's delegations traveling to North Korea and engaging with the um, with the Korean War, with the duration 
the derationality of, of the war, which is very much sort of what ties the objects together. It means that, you know, so there's a kind of extended temporality also in the objects. Some of them are kind of antique objects, you know, that are quite old. And some of them are more recent, you know, objects that I found in markets. You know, so some of them are vernacular, you know, not of a particular value, but some of them are a bit more precious, you know, so it's also kind of, um, I guess, yeah, working with sort of, I don't know, like sort of disentangling this kind of like hierarchy of, of objects or their, their value or their sort of historicity. Um, and then there, there are some, um, <coughs> and maybe I can just, I mean, there's, there's a few books in the boxes, you know, that are uh, very, um, that were very meaningful to me and that also were starting points for creating this work. And one of them, it's actually not this one, but it's in the first box by the entrance, is this book um, from North Korea, A Journey to the End of the World, is basically the translated title of Danish journalist and women's rights activist um, and member of the occupation movement in Denmark during the Second World War. Uh, and it's a book that she wrote um, after having joined an international women's delegation to North Korea um, at the height of the Korean War in 1951. And so it's a type of memoir um, in which she describes her experiences during this uh, trip to North Korea. Uh, but during this trip, she also reminiscences or recalls her own experience of war during the Second World War. She was interned in, in or she was sent to an internment camp because of her political, uh, you know, because of being part of the uh, opposition movement during the Nazi occupation of Denmark. You know, so there are these kind of recollections, you know, which I found really interesting, you know, that she describes, for example, being in North Korea and hearing the the bombings, you know, but but then she recalls her own experience of war. Uh, um, you know, so this is, there's a kind of, I think this whole sort of crossings of times and spaces is something that happens within the boxes and I think something that I also work a lot with filmically uh, the, you know somehow creating connections between times and spaces that are maybe not you know that are not read in a linear way um, and then another book that was very important to me uh, for thinking about this work um, is is this book um, it's called we accuse uh, and it's a it's a report uh, uh, written by the women's international democratic federation um, on the findings of, of this trip or, the, or their collective um, statement after returning from north korea in 1951 so this is also the um, the trip that Kate Florent uh, participated in. So it was a collection of women from various different countries across, uh, across the Cold War divide uh, who went to North Korea. Um, and so this picture on the first page is sort of this historical photograph of them. Uh, and so this is like one of the elements that connect. I mean, I mean, I think the work as a whole is is trying to engage these two histories. I mean, the other trip was the one I participated in in 2015, where I was part of an international women's delegation going to North Korea and crossing the border into South Korea. Uh, at the, I mean, 70 years after the division and, and sort of posing the question again of the, I mean, somehow of the unended status of the Korean War because uh, a peace treaty is yet to be signed. Um, and so there were these certain parallels between the two 
journeys. And so the boxes somehow also try to, in a kind of, as, as you're saying, um, I think in an associative way, compose certain intensities around, uh, I mean, maybe ad addressing this kind of like multi-sided uh, engagement with the Korean War as something that was never just a civil war or never just a war uh, that concerned Korea, you know, but that is, is very much also a, a, a global uh, conflict zone, you know, like, so, so, so that's also why, you know, you have these, like the objects sort of hint at, at these, um, I guess, like transnational relations that, that are part of, of this history. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and in, I don't know, there's something, I mean, it was interesting what you said about the, it made me think about, you know, when you were saying how, the objects are sort of layered on top of each other. I was thinking maybe it's almost like it's a bit similar to how, I mean, I can see how I do very much that thing in film, you know, sort of like compose these intensities, um, a type of montage in film. And I think that it, it's, it's in some ways, maybe it's like a kind of physical way of doing that with the objects um, in the boxes. <coughs> Speaking about film, do you you've planned to yeah I um, could kind of interrupt our conversation mm. with mm. Uh, yeah yeah filmic interludes? Yeah, I think I mean one thing you know so so this exhibition is a bit on the, I mean it's you know you see the objects and it's actually one thing that and we have been talking about that also in, in prior conversations, you know, like how in, in this particular work and exhibition, there's a lot of focus on, on the document, you know, on the archive. Uh, but a lot of what I have been interested in has also been um, working with uh, the voice, you know, the voice as, as a very important, um, element of, of many of my filmic works and, and also embodied embodied memories, um, embodied histories, perhaps those histories that are exactly not um, uh, written down in official uh, history books. And so one uh, short video clip that I would like to show uh, is um, the first couple of minutes of, of a quite early film, The Woman, the Orphan, and the Tiger. Um, and it's a, it's a film from 2010, a 72-minute film that traces... It, it, it traces um, a genealogy of three generations of women whom in different ways have been affected by histories of war and militarization uh, in and beyond the Korean peninsula. So one of these histories that the film engages is the history of the former comfort women who were taken as uh, military sex slaves um, by the Japanese army uh, between World War One and Two, uh, and the second uh, um, history that the film engages is the history of um, U.S. military prostitution in in South Korea uh, since the Korean War, and this is a kind of it's, it's also all of these histories are unfinished histories, so it means that the former comfort women for many years have worked to receive an official apology by the Japanese state, but have yet to uh, receive that, you know, so they're, they're launching these weekly Wednesday demonstrations. Um, so it's the longest ongoing demonstration in the world of these women that there's very few survivors left. Uh, and also the US military prostitution issue is, is another kind of like internal effect of war also because it's um, you have all these military bases still all around the country. And so an effect of, of militarization, you know, of course, being uh, forms of sexual uh, violence and abuse. 
Um, and then the third history that the film engages is, is the history of transnational adoption uh, from South Korea to various countries in uh, various Western countries, or countries that were aligned with South Korea. Um, and so these three histories are somehow intertwined or connected in the film, looking at the similar, like in, in the structurally similar mechanisms in, in which, you know, these histories have both been somehow suppressed. Uh, and, and how they have, you know, like how they have emerged at this intersection of forms of na nationalism and, and patriarchy and, and, and militarism. Uh, but the film, I mean, it's told, it told through a number of, um, of, of women, you know, so it's, it's, it's very much driven by uh, different voices. And I thought that it could be interesting to show the first couple of minutes of the film. I'm trying to figure out how I can talk about something that is unseen, that most people don't believe I in. Something really have horrible. Been having that very the, the secret dream. itself, or the gap in one's speech, gives rise uh, to a I ghost. And I a personal illness also. when you are eight, you can to have all the children in the And I really want to think of the adopted kids. When I'm not sleeping, my father is not going to be sleeping. is not going to be that matters is moved without our We call him the adopted child. I know that the parents are Person, place, or thing, key, bell, star, the last notes of Andante, a series of high G's against the dark forest of A flat, listen. These sounds are the things that we cannot talk about, things that we cannot name, but vaguely in metaphors. And although the end is approaching, it seems now that there is no true beginning except the one we mark officially with once upon a time. And in these stories, our own stories, we are always somewhere in the middle. So yes, the, the problem of the the archive is the archive. Um, the archive as uh, as a infrastructure that uh, attests from what is uh, supposed to be um, valuable to be archived, or um, the archive being the um, the way to institute a proof uh, for the writing of a specific history. And your work has been addressing a lot the missing archive of the persons who have been the inhabitants of this night of history, remaining outside of the frame for all the reasons that you've been evoking having um, in their destinies and bodies and suffering and traumas being uh, uh, sort of uh, left aside from the archival process. And um, your work kind of 
uh, tries to connect these different dots, these sort of light dots in uh, his uh, dark uh, space or black holes or um, sort of dead angles of history and create a sort of, uh, not fictional, but reconstructed plane on which these different uh, individuals and places and histories that are in different places and times uh, reconnect on the same plane. In that sense, it's, uh, it's a bit like um, uh, the, the work of the artist and one of the historian, the one of the astronomer, or the one of the um, horoscope are kind of connected in one very similar practice by devising constellations. Um, because when we look at the starry sky, uh, we look at all these uh, things that we imagine are uh, on the same plane, but in fact they are light years uh, from each other. And sometimes most of the stars that we see are already dead. They don't exist anymore. But the time the light comes to us uh, make them still present on our mind. But it's a work of imagination. So in that sense, um, I am seeing this exhibition as a way also to compose these constellations that allow a certain form of imagination or fabulation uh, a certain form of fiction, not in the sense that it's fake or not true, but in the sense that it allows itself to imagine connections between things that have been remained disconnected for several historical processes and political reasons. Yeah, it's quite beautiful with the, I mean, just to invoke, I guess the this idea of constellation or also of, of dots that are maybe normally not seen as connected. I think this was also very much with the woman, the orphan, the tiger, that, and I mean in this short clip that you see, it ends with this orphan choir, you know, that was staged. It is from a, like, newsreel footage, you know, and it was not, you know, if, if you look at these newsreel footages, you know, like, sometimes, the labeling or the categorization of, of the archive is, is, is not really what you are searching for, you know, so you have to find other ways to search because things are not necessarily, you know, like if you write, um, yeah, certain tag names, you might not find these images. So that's also like a kind of, I guess, laborious process of looking through material and finding I mean, I think that's, I mean, my interest in working with, with archive is maybe also to work with some of these archive materials that are somehow vibrating or that have not necessarily found their place, you know, that are still uh, actively, you know, asking questions to the present. Um, and I think what, what started this work, for example, was, you know, belonging to, you know, like also uh, like being someone uh, transnationally adopted from Korea and somehow belonging to, to, to a large group of people with that uh, similar sort of historical uh, condition, you know, um, like around 200,000 children uh, that were adopted from South Korea. Uh, since the Korean War. Uh, I think oftentimes this type of migration is seen as, I mean, in some ways as, as a type of orphans without a history, you know, but, but what I was curious about with this work was also to say, no, there actually is a history, there is a genealogy, but it's not necessarily the biological family genealogy, you know, that is important for us to look for. It's maybe to start looking for different kinds of political affinities with other groups of people in society who, in related, of course, different but related ways, have also, um, you know, encountered, or like, you know, like s somehow, uh, you know, uh, 
had to face similar kind of structural um, mechanisms, you know, so, so this was, you know, so it is sort of drawing a constellation that at the time when the film was made, it was not immediately, you know, people didn't necessarily look at these histories as related or connected. Um, so I think this is maybe, as you say, like a kind of work of, yeah, like an, an, an artistic sort of like um, insistence upon also seeing these connections, you know, and as a way to uh, to say that we can also compose history differently, you know, than than how the state, for instance, uh, wants to uh, to talk about this history. Um, as something isolated, but it's it's of course all connected. You know, uh, transnational adoption, of course, is not just an isolated history. It's, it's very much connected to the historical circumstances. Or we cannot see, you know, the uh, you know former comfort women issue as only something only concerning Japan. It's it's something that we see repeated in in wars again and again. You know, the issue of um, of sexual violence, you know, they, it, it's a mechanism, you know, so, so the film is trying to also point to that. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know, I mean, maybe we should see another uh, film clip. Um, I think another one that I would like to show is um, from Community of Parting, and it's maybe also drawing it a little bit back to to these works, I think the, these works in the exhibition, I mean, there's three different works. So there's the uh, the bread boxes, uh, and the, well, there's like the, this work on, on the wall from 2016 uh, related to this uh, these two international women's uh, uh, delegations to North Korea, and the same with the boxes here. And I think, you know, this experience or this, this trip, uh, participating in this trip really compelled me to think about the question of borders in, in a very sort of fundamental way, uh, but also encountering that the whole conversation around the division uh, is somehow very locked in the Korean context uh, and it's a kind of very sort of prolonged sort of like locked in a pro prolonged kind of Cold War binary and I was interested in sort of thinking about how can this question of borders also be engaged otherwise you know not only thinking about geopolitical borders but also other kinds of, of border producing mechanisms um, and so I became very interested in working with this uh, shamanic myth, uh, a Korean shamanic myth of uh, Bari, who was a princess uh, and who was abandoned, uh, but who, in it, it's a reframing of the myth. It's a kind of like feminist reframing uh, and reinterpretation of, of this myth. Uh, that that I did in Community of Parting. Uh, but what's interesting about this myth is that Bari is someone who refuses to accept the uh, divided uh, state. She, she saves her parents at some point and she is offered half the kingdom, but she refuses this and instead she chooses to become the goddess and mediator at the threshold of the living and the dead, you know, so she acts from this boundary space between the living and the dead, you know, so this myth became a type of metaphor of, uh, you know, figure for, for talking about um, different forms of divisions and separations and, and also for engaging um, uh, you know, Korea's uh, modern uh, history and, and circumstances. And it also involves a lot of different um, uh, diasporic um, positions. Um, but I think it would be nice to show um, 
the first seven, eight minutes of the film. And it also kind of shows, like I guess, like a type of filmic, experimental filmic way of working with both, um, you know, like recorded imagery. It's it's a film that took five years to make. It's it's filmed in in many different locations. It's engaging many many different people, uh, uh, largely people that that I, uh, you know, had known for a long time. And you know, it, it also stems from, I think, deeper conversation with. Uh, uh, with subjects that I think all in some ways could reflect or could see themselves also in relation to this myth of, of Bari. Um, and the very last person, like in, in, in the clip I will show, is Yaman Kusunan of Chetu Island, who is a kind of central figure that recurs throughout the film. There is a story that has endured division, yet is as old as division itself. It is the shamanic myth of the abandoned Princess Pari, who was exiled at birth for being born a girl. An initial story of gender transgression, a core motive of the myth, is resistance and restoration arriving through the figure of the other. What distinguishes the abandoned is a refusal to abide by human borders, to become instead the goddess and mediator at the threshold of the living and the dead. Within sentiments of border keeping, the diminishing of other knowledges and partial remembrance, the abandoned delineates a different approach. Gathering and mediating what has been torn. It is one of diffusing boundaries between past and present, self and other, here and there. Uses her own life story into the telling of the abandoned. Both my parents were originally from North Korea and they fled after the division before the war. 
거기에 미군들도 많고 한국 사람들도 많았어요. When my parents, when they first came to the U.S., came to Los Angeles, and my mom was situated in the garment district in downtown L.A., working in the factories there. 우리는 옛날에는 처음 물질 나는 게 굉장히 육지가 면천 나는 거는 뭐냐면 못 사는 사람으로 봤어요. Вот это вот депортация. О том, что наших родителей насильно сюда переселили. Совет Кореянс migrated from Korea before the division. It was the first deportation by Stalinist regime from Russian Far East to Central Asia and Kazakhstan. 시대가 폭발해서 이렇게 쓰러지니까 군인 아저씨들이 와서 저를 지어를 하고 이제 부대로 옮겨갔어요. 이제 공수를 얼마 하러 다니면요. 우리 할아버지는 일본에는 데 비켰까 봐. 조선 is a regional name of Korea before they separated. Many of my relatives still keep this North Korean nationality in Japan for resistance. Growing up as a teenager in West Berlin meant to live in this island. Some people had family in East Germany, but I did not know my doctor. Family didn't. いつ天然で行くちょうどなんなんで、これ何のご用語ですかこれ結構あるじゃん。もちろんあの山へなく自分の意思とは関係なく、あるいはあるいは山へないルームによって動いてる活動として逆に動いていく必要がない。生きてる
uh, of uh, this place, Jeju, uh, that is extremely important for you, and to which you've been addressing a series of, a lot of series of recent works. Yeah, no, I mean, I think the, I think something that, you know, I have been very drawn to, as you say, is is the shamanic, um, and particularly shamanic practice in, in Tietu Island, uh, which I think, you know, on, on a personal level is, is close to me because it's, um, it's where I was born, it's where my birth family is living. But Tietu Island as a space also holds a very particular, like uneasy, unstable um, place within the, the nation state, you know. So, so Tietu Island as a space that, um, I mean, in the past was um, was an independent island kingdom, you know, that has a particular, its own cosmology distinct from mainland Korea, its own kind of shamanic um, uh, traditions, very much sort of um, also um, informed by the natural environment of, of the island, being a volcanic um, island, you know, a, a culture that has largely relied also on on the sea, on on, on fishing and diving, you know, so, so it's a, uh, it's a, it's quite distinct from, from mainland culture historically. And it was an island that, you know, since centuries ago was used as, as many islands in, in the region of, you know, everywhere as kind of, you know, like as a prison colony where you would send political exiles or um, and then, then what happened uh, also leading up to the Korean War was that there was a large um, massacre. Um, so a er very early Cold War moment uh, played out also on the soils of, of Jeju Island. So it's also kind of important um, for sort of understanding, you know, like what led to, to the partition. Uh, but and, and one of the things, you know, this was a history you couldn't really talk about at all uh, for, for many decades. Uh, but one of the places where people could mourn the dead and indirectly speak about what had happened was through shamanic rituals commemorating the dead. You know, so shamans in Jeju, for example, also uh, Kusunan from the film. Uh, her father was victimized during the massacre, so she will always recall the victims of the Jeju April 3rd massacre in her rituals, you know, and so the whole sort of basis of this shamanic practice in, in, in Jeju is also very much like a um, transferring of all knowledge, of, of all embodied memory, you know, so, so a different kind of archive, or like approach to the archive or to history, you know, which, which is very much like an old tradition, you know, something that uh, as, as a way to invoke that which is not seen, you know, like what you talk about with the visible, in, invisible or the present, not present, you know, so in the, in, in the ritual performance, that would be a site where those that were disappeared who are no longer with us could be recalled. And within this shamanic ritual, a form of, it, it's very like, you know, so I observed all these different kinds of rituals. And I think one of them that, that really drew me to the practice is also that in some ways, it's a kind of, what happens is a, is a kind of, assemblage of those who are here and not here, you know, the, the shaman as, uh, creates an, an assembly of the living and the dead, you know, like within the momentary space of the ritual, you know, all the spirits of, of the dead and, and deities, but also very much the witnesses. It's, it's reliant upon the condition that you you have to have living witnesses to 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 the histories to the experiences of the dead um, 
and I think yeah in in Jeju, you know so so because of this particular history of of, of Jeju, I think that's also why I mean nowadays you you still see shamanic practice even though I mean not not only in Jeju, but you know like in 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 the country as such with with sort of like the the project of of modernity you know like uh, people try to sort of eradicate or you know like sort of suppress shamanic practice uh, you know but because of this i think partly history and also necessity of the continuity of of, of the rituals um you st you still have it as part of uh, the everyday in 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 smaller villages in in Tietu. Um, and I think for the film, I mean, it kind of, um, it's also, I mean, the, the, the Siamen as, as a figure who, who is also a mediator, you know, it, it's something about, um, uh, it's, a, it's a particular form of mediation of, of, of both like the seen and unseen histories, you know, through the, Shamanic, and I think just as a filmmaker, I found that very. I mean, it's something I've tried to work with, of course, in a different medium and from a really different vantage point. But this question of the mediation of histories, you know, this sort of um, working with, um, I think. Mm, Both the importance of sort of in, invoking certain histories or cultural forms that are on the verge of disappearance, you know, but also asking of them to, or sort of engaging them within our present reality, you know, like sort of working with that. Um, you know, so of course it's a kind of remediation, you know, when it's when it's film, and I think maybe it points a little bit to the most recent work uh, of of mine, like the w most recent film, uh, which is Burial of This Order, and may maybe some of you experienced it yesterday. We screened it um, at this other venue, and it's. Um, it's also taking place in Jeju Island, uh, but it's a very different kind of film. It's it's um, it's it's much more performative. You know, where one one way that I've worked a lot with film is is a more sort of observational, registration uh, kind of experimental documentary approach. But burial of this order is 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 very much a kind of performative gathering, I would say, of of a group of people. But it engages very much also um, or it it gestures towards also what has happened in in Jeju as a space uh, it takes place in in an abandoned tourist resort in Jeju island you know so even though this space has this history you know what has what happened in more recent decades it's is that the the island has also been uh, heavily imposed upon by tourism, uh, which is also threatening the 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 environment, you know, the natural environment of of the island and the coastal areas. So um, we filmed inside this um, building that, in a strange way, I also see as this kind of like crumbling infrastructure of sort of like capitalist colonial modernity, like it's, it's a very sort of striking space. And a group of people are gathered there to, maybe I should not say too much, and we can show the, just the trailer because uh, some of you have also seen it. <laughs> Um, um, um. 
Here in, in, in these boxes, we, we have these red lights. What can think of, you know, blood and transgenerational traumas, the emergency or the urgency of the war that's still there, even if not that visible or explicit, continuous or discontinuous that kind of invade uh, more or less uh, discreetly like um, our space time. Um, but it's also um, a sort of um, evocation. I've been thinking of also a sort of revelation process, like in a photographic laboratory when you use this red light and you plunge the paper, the white paper, in the, in the, the, the boxes. And then and, uh, I've been thinking that it might also be why on this screen, in, on exhibition mode, not during this talk, but during the when the visitors can visit the exhibition. There's another video work that is entitled Sweeping the Forest Floor, where you place the camera on a landmine detector in the DMZ uh, zone. Um, and uh, someone is uh, looking for one of the um, thousands of landmines that still uh, are there but not visible they are underground they are everywhere in a sort of idyllic landscape that looks totally pastoral but in fact is infested by the memory or by the remains of a world that's still present even if not manifestly present visually and i've been thinking that maybe your work is also kind of based on similar um, processes of investigation, revelation, and uh, making, appearing, or returning the invisible specters of uh, latent violence. Um, 
as if you had made your own sort of technological device to reveal these invisible histories. And in burial of this order, there's this very, very interesting protagonist in the movie that is this ruined uh, infrastructure where the performers, where the participants are gathering to create or recreate, we don't really know, a ritual that could be the starting point of something new or maybe the end of something or a failure or an attempt that so you don't really know where it's going to. But it poses the question, what should we do with our ruins? Uh, what should we build or should we build something on something that we've destroyed? Uh, what the purpose of a ritual and uh, how to make it not another conventional tradition, but something that's, that could be transformative. Yeah, with burial, and maybe it was a little bit hard to see on the, whoops, sorry, the short, um, the short trailer, but you, you have this group of people gathering to enact, I mean, I think, when I think of the work, you know, like what, what I was really interested in was to work in this space of what I really thought of as, as the intersection of, of um, ritual ceremony and political protest and, and something that is performative. Um, and, uh, you know, so this group of people come together with the aim of undoing an unlivable world order built on hierarchy and division. Uh, hierarchy and division not as defined in the work, but there's certain gestures, you know, through the props, you know, that uh, a kind of refusal of certain Confucian uh, hierarchies, uh, gender hierarchies, um, uh, but also the space sort of, um, uh, you know, also being very active. Um, it, it's working with a kind of un undoing of certain structures or mythologies, perhaps. Uh, uh, but then, you know, there's, there's some twists and turns in, in the film and it becomes a kind of dismantling um, and what, I mean, yesterday we were talking a little bit about that there's a type of ritual transformation that takes place and in the end the group of people are, are walking away with what was once um, the, the body or the container of what they were trying to undo, but that then gets tra transformed into something else, basically this this long cloth fabric, you know, that, that also has different meanings depending on which rituals uh, it is used for. Uh, and the work doesn't really conclude, you know, so it is a very sort of like symbolically laden work uh, and and I found it interesting, like how you talk about this, like you know what what is to come, or like how to not reproduce, you know, like what was there, and it's it's of course, uh, um, I I think that's why it it is somehow open ended. You see the space of of nature in the very end, and and with this. I think kind of like reflexive image, you, you sort of asked also as a viewer to consider some of these questions yourself. Um, I think maybe one thing I wanted to end with also with maybe the works that are li less visible in, in the work works themselves, you know, when the, you see them as film, but something that is really important to me. Uh, as you know as, as an artist and that I think with with all the films you saw today that somehow you know not just sort of like coming from me as an artist but they're also very much coming from all these different participants um, and collaborators to the work you know so both with um, the woman the orphan and the tiger and community of parting the works also in some ways was a 
a way to to bring together many different voices you know that have informed me and you know also people that you know that uh, I, I have done you know different forms of um, activism and thinking together with and i think this was something that was really special about burial of this order is that you know none of the participants are actors they were all asked to to participate you know like also if if they could see themselves in in the sort of like basics of of the script like this necessity to somehow undo a question you know the current order of division and hierarchy um you know but but also all somehow being people who have been invested in that you know in their own lives and practices either as uh, artists or musicians or poets or, or activists you know so this is something um it it just brought me back to to what you were saying earlier about this like way of 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 making constellations. Um. Well, it things like it seems like everything has been said. Maybe. Um, <laughs> thank you very much once again for uh, this very very inspiring um, presentation. Yeah, yeah. If you and agree. thank you, Jan. <laughs> thank you very much for your presence. Thank you very much.